Tonight's subject is Unless I Go Away. This is from that theme in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of John. Where he makes the statement, It is to your advantage that I go away. For unless I go away, the counselor will not come. But if I go away, I will send the counselor, and he will lead you into all truth. Not just a little piece, but all truth. Then he said, a little while, and you will see me no more. Again, a little while, and you will see me. And we are told they did not understand him. Now God speaks to man in vision. If man is so organized by divine providence for spiritual communion, God will speak to him in vision. And then it's his duty to tell it to the world as he moves through the world. Well, many, many years ago, I was taken in spirit. Here I was shown an enormous field of sunflowers and every flower, an enormous flower, was the human face, but it was a flower stationed in the earth. As I looked upon this enormous field of beautiful sunflowers and saw them move in rhythm, they moved in concert. If one smiled, all smiled. If one frowned, all frowned. If one moved, they all moved. Although stationary, they are bent, as though bent with the wind. And I knew as I observed this motion, this wonderful concert, that I enjoyed far greater freedom than all of them put together and multiplied by any number. And yet, looking at this beauty, I did not feel at the moment I could compare to such beauty. Yet, I was free. And they were not free. They moved in concert. And then I looked, and here was an enormous dove right next to the field of sunflowers. The human faces was a dove where all the garbage of the world was thrown. And here I saw a rat, an enormous rat. And I tried to catch him. And I caught the rat. And I caged the rat. Put him into a cage. And when I had caged that rat, then suddenly the vision faded. Then you must wait for its interpretation. But here he speaks to you and tells you. Now in 1937, Aldous Huxley wrote a book called Ends and Means. And in the book he said, I had motives for not wanting the world to have a meaning. Consequently, I assumed it had none. And I was able, without any difficulty, to find all the reasons in the world to support this assumption. He didn't want it to have any meaning because he wanted to tell certain things of this world to justify his behavior, to justify any violence that he might write about. But he didn't want it to have meaning. Well, he assumed it had none. And the assumption led him to find all the reasons in the world to support that assumption of his. I tell you, it has meaning. Everything in the world has meaning. A little feather falling from a bird flying through space has meaning if we only understood how to read it. But everything in the world has meaning. There's meaning. In the beginning was the word. And that word translated from the Greek logos means meaning. In the beginning is meaning. And meaning was with God and meaning is God. There is meaning to everything in the world. But as yet, you and I can't quite understand it any more than I could understand that vision 
I woke from it. I never wrote it down, but it's indelibly impressed upon me. I can't forget it. It happened many years ago. But now I'll tell you what it means. Because in the interval, other visions have thrown light upon it. The Gospels, the parables, are an acted story. God plays the central part. And we were just like the flowers, the sunflowers, with human faces, stationary and moving in rhythm to God's command. We were puppets. And God wants persons, not puppets. If I as a father took my son to camp, and then I left my son in camp, and then moved away, to him I would be caught up into a cloud, and I would disappear from his vision. But I do it for his benefit. I do it for his good. When God took us out of this heavenly square, we were only puppets, moving in concert. He brought us into this world called the world that is fallen for our good. That we may become, become completely individualized, even though we pass through hell to awaken as God. And so, in a sense, God was never more present than when he was absent. Because God, who had dwelt among us, in disappearing, dwells within us. He didn't send us out into this thing. God painted man and came with man. It's God playing the part in all this fabulous world of ours. And because he is invisible to our mortal eye, we think he is disappeared. No, he has never been more present. He was the orchestra leader when we were the field of flowers. And then he sunk himself in us and became invisible to us. But he is more present than when he dwelt among us because now he dwells within us. Just imagine the author of the whole vast universe conceiving the most glorious poem in the world. And the poem is perfect. It can't be improved on that level. But the author of the poem, the great poet that I call God, conceives a still higher level. And that level would be to individualize the characters and give them freedom and give them creativity in themselves and not just to move as the flowers moved because I compelled the motion and they all obeyed my command. And to do that, he disappears. He doesn't dwell among us, he dwells in us and goes through the entire drama until he awakens and he who awakens in man was the one who created the entire form to begin with. But now he individualizes all of us. And we, the characters of the poem, become one with the poet who created the poem. That's the story. So, in a little while, you will see me no more. And they were sad apart. Again, in a little while, you will see me. And when you see him, you'll see him entirely different. All the great scholars, like a Huxley, and all the great giants who understand Greek and Latin and Hebrew, and all these cries, they've searched the scriptures diligently. But they cannot find the Christ of whom they spoke, and the one of whom they prophesied. They can't, because they're looking for him from without. And may I tell you, the play is taking place within man. God sunk himself with the whole play, within his being, and he sunk himself in us. And then it happens in us. And then when it happens, the one in whom it happens proclaims it. That he is the embodiment in history of all that scripture, scripture prophesies. No one believes him. Because it is happening in the depths of the soul of man, and no one in the outer world looking for him to come from outer space would ever believe it. And yet that's the story of scripture. 
doesn't come out there at all. No conquering hero to enslave those who enslave Israel. No conquering hero in the world to come like some mighty, wonderful warrior. No. For his kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. So the whole drama unfolds in us. And it begins with the fulfillment of the prophecy made to Abraham. Now, Abraham is not a man. Abraham is the symbol of humanity. For in him are all. As you are told, you will have children, offspring, more numerous than the sands of the sea. Think of it. More numerous than the stars of the heaven. That's your children. Well, Abraham is simply collective humanity. Therefore here, God makes his promise to Abraham. And the promise was, in spite of your present age, in spite of all things to deny it, you will have a son. And the son will be your heir, not the one born of a slave, born of Hagar. He'll be born of Sarah. And your son will be the heir of the universe. And Abraham believed. Well, if Abraham believed, I was in his loins. That's collective humanity. Therefore, I believe. You believe, even though at the moment you may disbelieve, in the beginning you believe. And it was counted unto you for righteousness. So even though you go through all the disbeliefs of the world, and you are accused of being an agnostic, or even an atheist, I still know in the beginning, because you were in the one being who believed, you believe you are the offspring of Abraham. I don't care what the man will tell me. I've had atheists argue with me. Numberless atheists. I've had agnostics. All kinds of wonderful men and women. And they love to make you feel that they're so different. Perfectly all right. But I know in the depths of their soul, they believe when this was done in heaven. People can't believe there was such a character, such a state called heaven. Not a place. It's a state. And in that state of absolute innocence, you and I were innocent. And we were like flowers. Just like flowers. I have seen it. I have had glimpses where I came up on scenes and I stopped it and started it, stopped it and started it. And the whole vast world was under my control. And I didn't do it with a motion of my hand. I did it by control of my head. And so I would arrest an activity in me. And the world stood still. I released it, and it continued in its action. What it intended to do, I stopped it, and it stopped. I didn't stop it on the outside. I stopped the activity in me that animated it, the same like the flowers. And there is an apocryphal scripture, the apocryphal scripture of James. It was the night of the birth of the child, and it's told that Joseph went in search of a midwife for his Hebrew wife. And as he started, he looked up and the heavens stood still, and the birds of the air stood still, and the shepherds walking walked not, and the little sheep drinking drank not, and the workmen dipping from their dish to put it to their mouth dipped and dipped not, and chewing and chewed not, and everything stood still. And then suddenly all moved on in their course. And you'll find that in the Apocryphal New Testament of James. It's called the Apocryphal of James. What well, it happened to me, but not in the order that is now recorded. It was not the night of the birth of the child. That event preceded the event of the birth, which is only a symbol, by at least seven years. For well, on the 20th of July, three years ago, in this very city, I had the experience of being born from above. And yet seven years prior to that experience in New York City, I had the experience of having sections of the world stand still because I arrested in my head an activity which animated it. And when I released that activity, the things moved on. Birds flew and stopped when I stopped it. Leaves falling stopped and then the truck after I released it. And a waitress walking, walking, walk not. And diners dining, dine not. I stopped them. They couldn't move. And everything was done, not there, but done in me. And then it begins to 
I would turn over on the inside and wonder, what is it all about? Because you are spirit, and the being awakening is God. And the whole vast world, believe it or not, I look upon the world today as a resultant state. He didn't create it as I would create, say this. God's intention to bring forth something alive enough, which is himself, which he would call his son, resulted in the universe. The whole vast world is a resultant state. And that goes to all the garments, male and female, in the world. All the animals, all the kingdoms. And something in us is animating it. But as yet we don't know it. So the promise in the book of John, for which I've just spoken, that as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And that is what you and I are destined to have. That we are going to actually detach ourselves from this field of beautiful sunflowers with human faces and then pass through that horrible state which I saw as a donkey with the rats and all the monsters of the world and passing through that mess, that horrible mess we come out detached as sunflowers and awaken as God that's life so I tell you unless God disappears we will still be part of that chorus and we will sway by the impulse of God but then God subjects us unto this donkey it's a donkey as we are told in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans that the creature was made subject unto futility not by its own will but by the will of him who subjected him in hope that the creature would be set free from this bondage to corruption and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God so you and I did not choose to come here we were innocent and we were irreflective we were like sleepwalkers we perceived without noticing that we perceived now we perceive and we notice we perceive but in that freedom we make mistakes but may I comfort you you had to make mistakes as told us in the 11th chapter of the book of Romans that God's gifts and his call are irrevocable and it was God who was actually subjected all men to disobedience that he may have mercy upon all but who subjected who? God subjected all men you know who he subjected? he subjected himself he sunk himself in us and then subjected himself to disobedience that he may awaken that a pass through all the furnaces that he may awaken as the being that he is but in awakening he brings us with him individualized and he and I are one so God is giving himself to us as though there were no others in the world just God and you just God and I no other being and then we completely awaken and when we awaken we are one and it's God so don't be concerned and think that someone today because he's more wicked than you are or that you can remember that you've been that he is not saved or he will not be saved forget it not one being can be lost everyone is going to be saved and it's God playing all the parts and so he subjected me he subjected you he subjected every being in this world to disobedience that he may have mercy upon all and then he calls us because his call is irrevocable and his gift is irrevocable his gift is this when you lie down with your father meaning when you die that's a nice way of putting it and when your time is fulfilled and your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your father I will raise up your son after you who will come forth from your body I will be his father and he shall be my son out of us he does it now this is the most fantastic thing in the world no scholar seems to understand it and I must confess as I stand here I have 
not revelation. I have simply an intuitive knowledge of it. Based upon another revelation, but the actual statement in the 8th chapter of Proverbs is something that has confounded all the wise men throughout the ages. And listen to it carefully. There are about 10 verses beginning with the 22nd verse of 8th Proverbs. And it goes through just 10 verses. The Lord created me at the beginning of his way. I am the first of his acts of old. Before he brought forth the heavens, before he established the earth, before he set boundaries to the sea, before he did anything, I stood beside him as a little child. And I was daily his delight. It gives you so much to think about. They call this wisdom. Yet it does not say wisdom. It says a little child. I stood beside him as a little child. That the Lord created me at the very beginning of his way. I am the first of his acts of old. I stood beside him as a little child. Now, no man that I have read, I have read unnumbered Bibles and interpretations of Bibles and the different exegesis in the world, and no two agree, but no one will actually accept it as the ancient scriptures stated, a little child. And yet, I know from my own experience, there is that little child, and it's everlastingly a little child, and it's only a babe, wrapped in swaddling clothes. Was that what God created? Was that his initial act of creation? And he so loved it. It was daily his delight. Is that what God buried in us? Or well, we are told in the book of Ecclesiastes, God has put eternity into the mind of man. And the word translated eternity, which is Elam, is by definition a stripling, a youth, a boy, a little child. That's what my Bible tells me. I have Strong's concordance. I have Prudence concordance. I have many concordances at home. But James Strong's concordance is exhaustive. And it is really the guide for most people who are Bible students. And James Strong defines the word which our scholars translate eternity. And the Lord God has put eternity into the mind of man. And the word is Elam. E-H-L-E-M. Elam. And yet Strong defines that word as a lad. A stripling. A youth. Eternity is. Is that what God created in the beginning of his way? Is that that little child that stood beside him that was his daily delight? Is it that that he put into our mind? I say yes. Because my own experience bears witness to that. And yet, that is a sign. So I cannot completely ignore the interpretation of the great scholars. But the thing is not defined in strong as eternity. It's defined as a lad. It's defined as a youth. It's defined as a stripling. He put a stripling into the mind of man. He put a lad that was daily his delight. Now, is he going to bring it out? He promises, I will actually bring forth from your body. Your son. He will come forth from your body and I will be his father. And he shall be my son. Well, did he put that, that first creative act of his into my mind? Did he call it then his son? If he called it then his son, and he sunk it in us, all of us, when he brings it forth, and it that is brought forth is our son, then who will be? Well, upon it. If he brings forth from me his first creative act, and when I see it, it's my son, but it was his in the very beginning of time, and it's my son, and in the beginning it was his, then who am I? You get it? It's God. 
has a son. His first creative act, these are the words, God created me at the very beginning of his way. I am the first of his acts of old, before he brought forth the heavens, before he brought forth the earth. When there were no depths, I was with God. Before he set boundaries to the waters, before he did anything, I stood beside him as a little child, and I was daily his delight. Is it that that God put into us? Were we the flowers that I saw? These stationary things and God sunk in us, his first creative act, and then if he could transform us by sending us through that horrible state I saw, for well, this is a horrible state, war is a horrible state, poverty is a horrible state, pain is a horrible state, man dying slowly of leprosy, discarded by society, die of cancer, die of anything, and to be ostracized in the world, that's that horrible thing I saw, like a rat feeding on all the waste of the world. And yet in us, detached from that heavenly bliss of innocence, and to fall into this state. Now the one who brought us forth, called Jehovah. Do you know one of the means given to Yahweh Balkhay in Strong's Concordance? It is self it is stated the self existent being. But he is called Hey Balkhay, which is the root of the word Yahweh Balkhay, is the one who fell. It was God who fell, or causatively, the one who causes to fall. And so here, it was God who fell. You didn't fall. You had no choice in the matter. You were stationary. You were, for God's infinite purpose, detached from innocence, and sent into a world of experience. And passing through the horrors of experience, you awakened as God, a fully blown eternal imagination. And so here, Hebalke, the root of the verb, is one who causes to fall, one who blows, and causatively, one who causes the wind to blow. So I will tell you with the poem. All, were, all things in eternity were shown us, all was foretold. Not could we foresee, but we learned how the wind would sound after these things should be. So I had no knowledge in eternity that this thing was literally true until it began to happen in me. And so I read the same thing that you read. I read what the scholars, but I'm not a Greek scholar, I'm not a Latin scholar, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, I know a little of each. But I don't know anything really when it comes to these great languages. I know a little Hebrew, a little Greek, a little Latin, just enough to know, look up a word but I really don't know these terms. So if the great scholars who can speak in these terms cannot bring themselves to say that God, although the word tells you it's a lad, it's a stripling, it's a youth, and they cannot, in translating that word in Ecclesiastes, say God put a lad in the mind of man. They have to say God put eternity in the mind of man. And I tell you, he put a lad there. But the lad he put there, his first creative act, which was his son, he now climbs in us, and he brings him forth as told us in the book of Samuel. When you sleep with your fathers, I will raise up your son after you, who will come forth from your body. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. He comes forth, and I am his father. Well, if I am his father, then who am I? When he was God's son. That's how God gives himself to us. So God's purpose is to give himself to man, as that man, and that man as God. And the only way he can do it is to give that man his son. So no one knows who the father is except the son. That's what we are told in the book of John, no one knows the father but the son. So if I see the son, then he put that son into my being in the beginning of time, when he detached me from the world of innocence the world of love, and sent me through the furnaces of experience. And then when I was completed in God's eyes, he brought forth his son. In bringing forth his son, he brought me forth as himself. 
and there I saw his son, and his son is my son. Therefore God made me one with himself. So I say that story is true of every being in the world. Everyone could have experience. Therefore today you and I will fight. And as nations we fight nations. But just imagine when you are the same being that I am. Because you have the same son. If you are the father of my son, you and I are one. So when we have full knowledge of it, we couldn't fight. Because we are the father of the same son. And it has no mother. It's self-begotten. So I am actually the father of God's only begotten son. And I know you are. But if you don't know it, you'll fight with me. Argue with me. And try to destroy me. Now listen to these words. Taken from the book of John. The same chapter 16. And they will excommunicate you. And they will kill you. And think they do God a service. And this they will do because they know not the Father. God believed in, fatherhood ignored. So the whole vast world, if they have any concept of a God, they will say, yes, I believe in God. And so every Christian say, I believe in God. Every Jew, I believe in God. Every Mohammedan, I believe in God. Call by different names, but we believe in God. But even then, we kill each other. And these are the words. They will excommunicate you. Put you out of the synagogue as unfit to mingle with those who they consider right. And they will kill you. And they will kill you. And believe they do God's service. And this they do because they know not the Father. Is that clear? Believe in God and kill and murder. And I do it only because I don't know the Father. The moment I see the Son, I know the Father. I mean, if you come into my world and you tell me you're the Father of David, you and I are one. Then the whole vast world tells you they're the Father of David, then we're one. How could I destroy myself? That impulse to destroy myself will completely go. So I couldn't hurt you. Whatever I do then for you, I'm doing it for myself. And they'll kill you. And believe they do God's service. And this they do because they know not the Father. Is that clear? Believe in God and kill and murder. And I do it only because I don't know the Father. The moment I see the Son, I know the Father. I mean, if you come into my world and you tell me you're the father of David, you and I are one. Then the whole vast world tells you they're the father of David, then we're one. How could I destroy myself? That impulse to destroy myself will completely go, so I couldn't hurt you. Whatever I do then for you, I'm doing it for myself. If tomorrow you needed anything and it's in my pocket to grant it, I'm only giving it to myself. If you needed a meal and I could grant it, I'm not feeding another, I'm feeding myself. Then you'll understand these words. And so I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. And I was thirsty, and you gave me not to drink. And I was an Eden shepherd, and you didn't take me in. I was in need of raiment, and you didn't clothe me. When did we do these things? When you did not do it to the least among one of these. You didn't do it unto me, because I am the whole vast world. I am the Father, and although they do not know as yet, they are the same Father, having the same and only Son, you didn't do it to me when you didn't do it to them, because that's the Father. And so, God believed in, fatherhood ignored. So the Father is telling us the whole story. Before we set sail into this world of experience, the whole drama was told us, the whole thing was told us. All was foreseen, not could I foresee. But I learned how the wind would sound after these things should be. And so I can feel compassionate for any being in this world because I didn't know it until after these things should be. When it happened to me, I went back and read scripture. And the whole thing was there, but I didn't see it. I didn't know it until the infant was put in my hands and told me by one of the wise men who discovered it that it's my baby. And yet I know that was put into my mind in the foundation of time. 
So he, God has put eternity into the mind of man, and the word eternity means a lad, a babe, a youth, a stripling. So listen to these words in the book of Samuel. Tell me, Abner, whose son is that youth? I do not know, O king. Inquire whose son the stripling is. Same word. Youth, the first time he asked it, stripling the next. And then he doesn't understand. And then he turns to the youth himself. He said, whose son are you, young man? And this word, Elam, is translated youth, young man, child, stripling, and yet our scholars can't bring themselves to use any one of these words in describing the statement, which is the same word, Elam, in the book of, the, of uh, Ecclesiastes. So when Ecclesiastes says, God has put eternity into the mind of man, God has put his first creative act, which was a stripling, which was a youth, into the mind of man. And he's going to bring him forth. And when he brings him forth, the man from whom he brings him forth is going to look at him and see his son. And he has no, until that moment, he had no knowledge he was related to that son. And now he sees he's the father. So the greatest prayer in the Bible is the 17th chapter of John. The whole thing is a prayer. And he says, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory that I had with thee before that the world was. Before the world was, I had this glory with thee. Now glorify thou me with thy own self. He's asking the Father. And he reveals the name. He said, I reveal your name. I've told them your name. And the name he tells them is Father. And so he comes to reveal the Father. Now that you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I've been with you so long, and yet you do not know me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. How then can you say, show us the Father? So everyone in the world is moving towards that fantastic experience of being the Father of God's first creative act, which was his Son. And so if you are the Father of God's first creative act, then you are God. Now this is the great mystery. That which was created and therefore had a beginning by God's infinite love for his own creation, that is us, sinking himself in us, he transforms that which had a beginning into that which has no beginning. For God in becoming us, we who had a beginning, when that which has no beginning possesses us, and reveals his first creative act as our creative act, our son, then we are beginningless. And then you will know that mysterious statement in the book of Genesis and repeat it only twice, once in Psalms and then again in the book of Hebrews. And it's called Melchizedek. One who has no father, no mother, no genealogy, no background. No father or mother. No beginning of days and no end of days. And Jesus becomes, he who was the first raised from the dead is made a member of the order of Melchizedek. So everyone is brought into a state where he has no father. He is father. He has no mother. He has no beginning of days and no end of days. Can you conceive of such love? Can you conceive of that infinite mercy that is God's? That he would take us, his created, and so fall in love with his own creation that he gives himself to it and shares his first creative act, which was his own begotten son, and gives me as my son, his son, making me one with himself. And because he has no origin, I have no origin. What a fantastic mystery. I did have an origin. He created me. And yet, having been created, therefore having a beginning, he rubs out beginnings altogether. And then I become one without beginning. And all this is brought to pass by going away. Unless I go away, then you will have no life. 
This is the secret, the mystery of life through death. The grain of mustard seed or the grain of wheat. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much. The mystery of life through death. So God, the seed, falls into us and forgets he is God and goes through that horrible mess that I saw in my vision. And it dies to all knowledge of being God. And in dying, it brings forth much. The mystery of life through death. So, believe it. A little while, and I go away. This took place in eternity, when we were all innocent. Again, a little while, and you will see me. I will go away, and you will see me no more. And they were very sad, because he who walked among them, and dwelt among them, now ceases to dwell among them, because he's gone now dwell in them. So they can't see him if he dwells in them. And so the visible presence of God disappears. And so he does not move them like an orchestra leader would move an orchestra. He dwells in them and they can't find the author, they can't find the leader. And then they're detached by that entrance into them and they pass through hell. But passing through hell is for a purpose, to awaken as God. And so when you know it, when you've had a few experiences, you can forgive every being in this world. Because you're forgiving yourself. So in the end, if everyone is going to be the father of the same child that is your child, he is you. So you really never helped another. There was no other. And yet all are completely individualized. And so when man completely awakes, he's completely individualized forever and forever. And yet he's one with all that are equally individualized. And all the father of the one begotten son. So you dwell upon it. It's not the easiest subject to take up. But may I tell you, although it may not seem to pay off in dollars and cents, it will pay off beyond the wildest dream. Because you know who you are the heir of? And who is your son? Your son is the heir of the universe. And you know who made him the heir? You. Therefore it's all yours. The whole vast universe he gave to his son. And therefore that son is your son. So listen to these words, the 50th chapter, the book of Psalms. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. For the earth is mine, and the fullness thereof. The cattle on a thousand hills are mine. So were I hungry, I would slay and eat. Wouldn't ask your permission. So you don't have to ask any man's permission in this world to appropriate anything in the world. So you want a building? All right. Sleep tonight as though it were yours. May I tell you, you aren't stealing. In a way that no one knows, the world will be adjusted for it to be on the block for sale. And the means to purchase will become yours, if that's what you want. So you don't ask any man's permission in this world for anything. You appropriate it. You go back and read the 50th Psalm. If I were hungry, I would not ask you. For the world is mine and all therein. The cattle on a thousand hills, they're mine. And were I hungry, I would slay and eat. So you slay by appropriating. If you wanted anything, you simply this night sleep as though you were the man, the woman, that you would like to be, and you appropriate it. And then the whole vast world, being yourself pushed out, is quickly reshuffled to form the image of your appropriation, to bear witness to it. So, don't feel neglected. We are exiled. But you know who's exiled? God is exiled. It was God who fell for a purpose. He fell, sunk in us. And all the imagery of the Bible is true. Every bit is true. Now listen to these words that comes in Blake's great Jerusalem. Blake would not sign his name to his poem Jerusalem, or he said he did not write it. It was dictated. And when he was questioned, he said, the authors are in heaven. They are in heaven. They are not on earth, no one on earth. 
aided him with the poem. In all of his other poems and his paintings, he signed his name as the author of the poem, signed it as the artist who painted. But when it came to Jerusalem, he would not sign it. He said he did not create it. It was dictated sometimes 20 lines at a time. And he said the spirit of prophecy, which is called Christ Jesus in the Bible, dictated it. Morning after morning, he would wake to see the spirit of love hovering over him and dictating the words of this mild song. Now listen to these words. I behold the visions of my deadly sleep of six thousand years, dazzling around thy skirts like a serpent of precious stones and gold. I know it is myself, O oh my divine creator and redeemer. And after this is dictated, then these words are dictated. Fear not. Unless I die, thou canst not live. But if I die, I shall rise again, and you with me. Wouldst thou love one who never died for thee, or ever die for one who had not died for thee? And if God dieth not for man, and giveth not himself eternally for man, man could not exist. Therefore God dies. God dies by sinking himself in man. And then dying in that sense, he rises, but this time he rises with man. And man rises with God. So he who had no life independently of God's perception of him, now rises as God the perceiver to animate all things. So as the Father had life in himself, now he is granted to man, his son, to have life in himself. And all rise. You get the mystery? It's the most fantastic thing when you dwell upon it. And then as you dwell upon it, you do not feel for one moment that you're doing anything wrong when you want something in this world and you appropriate it. You don't steal it from anyone, just appropriate it. You want a hat and it's in the window and you can't put your hand in your pocket and find money to buy it? Wear it as though you bought it. A suit of clothes, a home, anything, just appropriate it. It's all yours for the appropriation in this manner. Don't steal it, because God doesn't steal, it's all his. You couldn't steal from yourself, therefore you simply appropriate it. And live as though it were true. And in a way that no one knows the state appropriated in your mind's eye will crystallize and become to you an objective fact. And then you will know this fabulous mystery, unless I go away. And so, a little while, and you'll see me no more. Again, a little while, and you'll see me. So God disappears from man, sinks himself in man, and then you do not see him for a little while. Then comes the six thousand years of a deadly sleep. How would we know when you're going to come? What are the signs of your coming? Listen to the words. As the lightning comes out of the east and shines as far as the west, so shall the Son of Man come. And you read it, and I read it, I couldn't get it. What does it mean? Lightning coming out of the east, shining as far as the west. And in this way, so shall the Son of Man come, sitting in the sense, until the morning of the 8th of April, 1960, when a bolt of lightning that I have never seen anything comparable to it, but it was in my skull. That was the origin of it. And it split me from the top of my skull to the base of my spine. And it revealed the golden serpent and I, a golden liquid being, as an I, as a serpent, moved up into the throne of God to be one with those who surround him. And they're called the seraphim, the plural. And they are the celestial beings. They are the fiery serpents. They are the princes of God. So he who descends is he who ascends. So he told you come, I will come like a bolt of light. Out of the east and split it right down as far as the west. And then so shall the Son of Man come. And then he lifts up and I am he. 
and we all move together to remain there until all are brought in and to be one with God. And let us go into the silence and appropriate any dream you want in this world. Want a home, a business, more money, I don't care what it is, a state of health, romance, anything in the world, it's all yours for the taking. But we are the offering power and it will not operate itself. We are learning to operate it. Before we came into this world, detached from that state of innocence, we couldn't operate anything. We were operated on by God, like an orchestra moved by the conductor. But we were detached and sent in, and now we are the offering power. So now you operate it by daring to assume that you are the one that you want to be, and dwelling in that state, you become it. Now let us go. Yes. I wish you Well, I would love to. I read Johnson's book. Johnson confesses himself. He is a man without vision. That's his confession. He's never had a vision. He's never had a mystical experience. He is the headmaster of Queen's College of the University of Melbourne. And undoubtedly a very able man. He calls himself a physicist. That is his profession. And my only experience with Johnson is second hand. I like what he's done in In Prison Splendor, Dressing to Immortality. The last book, Watcher on the Hill, I didn't care for it. It was simply like a pot boiler. But after he brought out Nursings of Immortality, a friend of mine sent him two of my books, Your Faith is Your Fortune and Awakened Imagination. And I have a copy of the letter that he wrote to my friend. It was not very flattering. And not very nice of him or wise of him. For the Bible tells us that he who answers without fearing, it is folly and shame unto him. So the person's opinion on a book that I have not read is stupid in the extreme. And he wrote to say that my title, Your Faith is Your Fortune, is a phony title. It should be Your Faith is Your Fortune. And he never read the book, as he said in the letter. And he wouldn't read any book who only signed his name Neville, and not, it was too theatrical, not signing a last name or a first name. He didn't know whether it was a last name or a first name. And his whole letter to my friend was so stupid, a little child could have written it. Well, I said to myself, all right, here's a man without vision. So the man without vision, no matter what he has to say, doesn't interest me. He would only read the book if it could be signed with many degrees behind the name, and not sign one name, but it would have many names. I always, when I got my letter, I had the impulse to write him, which I didn't, and asked him, what was the last name of Jesus? Or what was the last name of Paul? Or the last name of Moses? And I wonder what is God's last name? So, but, I mean, these, com these little silly things, he, he placed a small little part in his letter. He didn't read the book, not one word of it. He judged it by its title. And then passed an opinion. So what he has to say about time doesn't interest me at all. Any other questions, please? Yes, ma'am.
So you realize that, you know it isn't necessary to put it in the door. I'm sure you will be standing with them and get down on their knees and look up and say, Where is the house of having eyes? The house of turning to be informed that they are another house of this day is infinite intelligence. If it is infinite intelligence, it doesn't mean much construction. Well, my dear, God does speak to us in dream, but we are past masters at misinterpreting the dream. And quite often, an unpleasant dream is not necessarily an unpleasant message that God is giving us. When I caught that rat, it wasn't a very pleasant experience. And I put it into a cage, and yet that experience came at the same time, the same night, of the flowers with human faces anchored and all moving in concert, all moving together in unison. And so it took me years for God to throw light upon the difference between being one of an infinite number that could not in themselves initiate a thought and one, horrible as it was, that could actually initiate something. So I was detached and I was catching a rat. And I cut it in the most horrible, monstrous thing. I mean, waste. For as a dump heap. Yet I was infinitely more free, though in that environment, than I would have been one of an infinite number of beautiful flowers with human faces. So that experience, one would think, my Lord, if I went to some psychiatrist or some psychoanalyst, he would have given me all kinds of explanations about the uh, rat. But that was not it at all. I had to go through these experiences. So the unlovely experience of dream doesn't mean that God in any way is hurting. Not for one moment. Bear in mind God is infinite love and it's God himself blamed upon. If I have an experience, you know who's experiencing it? God. Because I am, that's his name. He has no other name. He's experiencing whatever I experience when I say I am experiencing this. And so, don't, don't be concerned if the dream is, on the surface mind, unpleasant. It tells us much, but don't try to interpret it. Just let the light come. It may come tomorrow, it may come next month, it may come next year. It will come. But God speaks to us in dream and reveals himself in vision. But I'm telling you, from my own experience today, in the last three years, the visions have been so vivid, and a vision to me is reality lifted to the nth degree of intensity. It's heightened intensity. Much, much more real than anything on the cell. And so you come back with this indelibly impressed upon you. And I can tell you today, you are not woman, you're a man. My wife is not woman, she's man. I am not a male, I'm a man. So about this organization is where the drama takes place. And God is man. And you are the father, not the mother. You are the father of David. And it's not going to surprise you at all when it happens. With all your femininity and my wife's femininity, she is going to have the experience of being the father of David. And my God is very, very feminine. She's going to have the experience of being the father of David. And she who today seems to be other than myself, my daughter, will tomorrow be having the same father of the same child will be born. And then we'll know that fantastic statement in the Bible. For the lawyer's road to throw him. The purpose behind the question was to defeat him. And he said to be a child master, in a very flattering way, what is the greatest of all the commandments? And he said, Here O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. To understand that in Deuteronomy, and that's the true story. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. Now what does it mean? The word translated Lord is God in love, the self-existent is called by us, Jehovah, called by us in translation, the Lord. The word translated, our God, is Elohim. It begins in the very first verse of Genesis. In the beginning, God. We get to the heavens and the earth. That word translated God is Elohim. It's a proof. It's one made up of many. And then the last word, again, is a repetition of the Lord. So it is, Hear, O Israel, 
Jehovah. Our enemy. One Jehovah. You know who the enemy are? We do. All of us, we form the Elohim. We are the gods. The gods who actually became man. That man may become God. We are the Elohim. And all of us together, when completely away, we form one Jehovah. Good night.